Hello, and welcome to the inaugural Miles Franklin audio blog. I'm Media Director Andy Hoffman, and I hope to include our entire Miles Franklin blog team going forward, including CEO David Sheckman, Associate Writer Bill Holter, and possibly President Andy Sheckman. I'm not sure of the degree of regularity that I'll be doing this, but we really felt we should uh, put our feet in the water and, uh, and start doing some audio blogs because I think it's a really good way of getting some points across that may not get through in the much longer written blogs. And given the events of the past week or two, I think it's a perfect time to start. So today I'm just going to give you a quick rundown of some of the things going on so that you um, better understand where we are with the, uh, the global economy and of course the precious metals market and what we might expect going ahead. Uh, for one, of course, I have to talk about this hideous tapering. I'm so sick of hearing this word. Uh, you know, we first heard the word exit strategy back in about 2010 or so. Uh, that's about the same time. We also heard Bernanke's green shoots, where the uh, mainstream media and the politicians and Wall Street uh, would try to convince you that there was some sustainable economic recovery going on. And, of course, recovery is a very ambiguous uh term because anything better than the bottom of 2008 is I guess a recovery but the fact is uh, especially in the United States where you have such a giant growing population you need more than just recovery from the lows to sustain an economy and certainly if there were freely traded markets uh, to sustain equity valuations and and now that we have no one else buying bonds to sustain credibility and, uh, and interest in, in US Treasury bonds and the dollar for that matter um, look, I have said along that they can never taper, ever, 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 uh, because fiat currency regimes are Ponzi schemes by definition. And what I mean by that is they must grow larger to be sustained. And, of course, there has to be confidence maintained in them, hence the propaganda that goes on all day long in the market manipulation. Uh, but as for this actual tapering, we already saw in June that the only real giant uh, buyers of treasuries in the past, the Chinese and the Japanese, have turned sellers. So if they're not buying, as I wrote in a piece two weeks ago, then who is? Of course, it has to be the Fed. And even the hint that the Fed may not stop tape, not stop QE, but actually slightly slow it down has caused interest rates to double in the States in just a matter of three or four months. And now we've seen all the real economic data roll over dramatically. And I'm not talking about these stupid diffusion indexes like the uh, ISM and the PMI or the, the Philly Feds where they just re have, they survey a handful of people and they manipulate the data. And it's really meaningless. Uh, but when you talk about the real data, uh, things like the real employment, which we see all the time, the record low labor participation rate, the real durable goods orders down 7.5% last month. Retail sales have been uh, flat for two months, and that's that's nominal retail sales. You know, in real terms, they're down. Uh, so across the board, the economy's rolled over. Refinance activities, since rates have gone up just this minuscule amount, are down 70 percent, just three months. So we're back to where we were in the you know the early 2009 lows. So the economy is clearly rolled over, and hence we had no tapering. And why the even with propaganda, why anyone would stick their neck out saying they thought that there would be this tapering, uh, let alone everybody. I mean, this was the consensus is beyond me because there's absolutely a thousand reasons why they shouldn't and literally none that I could think of why they should uh, other than it being the right thing. and They're not going to do the right thing. And so, of course, they didn't taper. And, um, you know, I still believe that the, that the higher rates are going to continue to hit the economy going forward and that there's, there's a better chance that we see QE5 announced before we see tapering. Uh, in fact, we may never see tapering. And if we do, it's only going to be a very token amount, uh, which will probably be reversed very quickly once the markets react to it, which I assure you they will. As far as what happened in the markets, I mean, again, you read the propaganda about, uh, well, the mar equity did this and stocks, uh, gold did this and bonds. Look, they're, you know, these uh, same market manipulators are in there every day. The fact is, stocks are actually slightly down from when the announcement was made. Uh, interest rates have come down. They were about 290, now they're about 275.
But again, you have to discount everything that actually happens in the market uh, because for all you know, the Fed did a uh, double dose of, uh, of QEing while they announced this because, of course, they need to prove to you that what they said uh, holds true. That is, if they're going to continue tapering, well, it must mean that rates are going to go back down. Uh, so, you know, as I wrote the other day as well, I mean, you can't believe anything they say. If they say they're, printing, they're buying $85 billion a month, they could be buying $185 billion a month, just like we have this PPT, which is, you know, making the same chart pattern in the Dow day in and day out uh, that's causing uh, equity valuations to separate more from reality than they ever have. And, uh, you know, so I wouldn't even give consideration to what you read in the media about the market. As for gold, look, the true reaction uh, to, uh, to the announcement came right afterward. Gold went up $55 uh, in the two hours uh, after. In fact, the, the data was clearly leaked to Wall Street because it started going up uh, a couple of minutes before. It's just a, a sickening, blatant uh, manipulation of the market. But nevertheless, the real reaction was the early one. And of course, um, the powers that be are very eager to not let that be seen as the reaction, uh, the true reaction, uh, you know, the safe haven reaction. So, of course, you know, they started their game by capping at every major key attack time on Thursday. And anyone who's watching the mining stocks saw that there was a, at the lows on, on Thursday afternoon, the Huey was down uh, almost 5% with gold and silver unchanged. And the market's relatively unchanged. This is a typical cartel signal that they've used for the 10 years that I've been watching, the 11 years, which means we're going to attack gold the next day. And sure enough, they, of course, went at it on, on Friday morning. There was no news to account for it. There was no real major movements. And, you know, all the hit in gold and silver happened before the Dow's uh, fall late in the day. And, of course, the Dow fell exactly 1% because that's its limit. So the fact is you still have the same gaming um, of the markets and the, the media, but the fact is, uh, believe me, the entire world is on alert right now because this is an extremely ominous announcement by the Fed that they, even despite everyone thinking they were going to taper, that they uh, didn't do it. And uh, believe me, there's going to be more and more Eastern buying going on, especially during this seasonally strong time of year because of that announcement, notwithstanding, uh, you know, the cartel's attack on Friday. Um, now, leads me to the uh, ne next thing. Again, we've been uh, told for weeks now that Syria uh, is a big reason why gold went up and down. But the fact is that the gold and silver markets, uh, the recoveries they had from their lows uh, in late June, were 90% done by the time the, uh, the chemical alleged chemical attack uh, occurred on August 19th. By then, gold was already up from 1180 to 1375. And uh, silver was up from uh, 1950 to about uh, 2350. So they only moved a couple of percent higher afterward, and uh, and the stock markets never reacted at all to it. So I think there was not the slightest real reaction in the markets uh, at all, other than crude oil, to any of the Syria stuff. And and when it inevitably inevitably didn't happen, uh, gold and silver were not hit because of that. Uh, they were just hit because uh, that's what the cartel's been doing. And because, of course, they knew that the FOMC was going to uh, announce no tapering. And they knew if gold was sitting at 14, 1450 at the time, it probably would have blown through the 1500 level quickly, blown through the 1550 level, uh, which is where it was in April before they, uh, they attacked with what I call the uh, alternative currencies destruction. And the next thing you know, it could be uh, above the 1670 level it started the year at, which would be a major, major failure for the cartel, probably the worst failure they've ever had and believe me they're going to fail it is going to go through 1670 but if it does it by year end and gold does in fact have a 13 straight up year after all that it's been through this year it would be quite a quite a signal for that the cartel losing control um uh, so and by the way i don't know if anyone noticed that it was either thursday or friday that ballyhooed uh, deal between the united states and russia which is not really a deal at all. Look, the U.S. is desperate for a war, uh, and Russia just uh, basically outsmarted them and, you know, dip, used diplomacy to, to make us not have a war. But the fact is, the deal that Kerry made with the Russian uh, diplomat is now off indefinitely because uh, Assad said, basically, I'm not going to comply. And uh, surprisingly, the media didn't talk about that at all. And trust me, Syria hasn't gone away. 
Now the next thing we're going to look at, of course, is the government shutdown, which we go through every year at the end of the fiscal year. It ends in September. And, uh, you know, they, they talk about a budget. Meanwhile, we haven't had a budget. I think this is five years now. We don't even have a budget proposal as we are about to uh, shut the government down um, right now. Unless, of course, they, they pass one of these stupid omnibus spending bills, which will probably be a trillion dollars or so. The problem with this particular one is the Republicans are, uh, you know, they're trying to use Obamacare as a political tool right now. And look, no, no one hates Obamacare more than me. And frankly, um, no, the, you know, they should uh, shut the government down because it'll be better for everyone. The problem is that there are a lot of people that rely on it right now, which is why we have a record high uh, food stamps and disability and entitlements. In fact, more than half of America is on entitlements. And when you threaten to shut the government down, let alone with all those jobs, and right now, sadly, the government jobs pay more <laughs> than a lot of the private jobs. I mean, you could do some real devastating damage to the economy. Uh, for the record, the House has now voted 42 times to repeal or defund Obamacare, all symbolically because they knew every time that, that it wouldn't pass uh, in, the, in the Senate and, uh, and the President, but they keep doing it. And this is, you know, this is your Congress in action. Uh, this time around, they're trying to use it as a tool to shut the government down and try to get Obamacare stopped. And, um, you know, I think it's going to just be extremely ugly for the next week. And then they'll pass it because that's what the government does. Ultimately, they print money and they spend it. And uh, they will pass something. They will not uh, stop Obamacare. Heck, if they wanted to stop Obamacare, then Chief Justice Roberts, a Bush nominee... A Republican shouldn't have been the deciding vote to declare it constitutional, but that was their chance, and they failed at it. So I can't see how Obamacare is not going to happen. Uh, it's going to be a disaster for America. Uh, but as of this government shutdown stuff, it happens every year, and I expect, as always, that they will uh, find a way to print money and spend it. Now, the debt ceiling is another uh, one because that's coming up only about two weeks later. Remember, uh, by mid-October, we're told, uh, somewhere around there, the extraordinary measures that have been used to delay uh, the breach of the debt ceiling, which really aren't delaying anything, they're just making it larger, uh, they're going to run out of, of, of tools and they're going to have to do something. Now, just to give you a little background, because you're going to hear a lot of uh, erroneous, in fact, I haven't read anything about this lately, which shows you how little people care about what matters. Uh, but basically where we were, remember the debt ceiling was $14.186 trillion uh, in August 2011. Uh, that's when they, uh, when S&P stripped the U.S. of its AAA rating. I mean, it should, it should, be, a, it should be a junk rating, but okay, we'll take that. Um, and when that happened, they said, all right, we're going to raise the debt ceiling to $16.5 trillion, but only if a super committee, a bipartisan super committee, will create cuts that match the two and a half trillion dollars of increase. Well, that super committee, if you remember, in late 2011, didn't come up with a single penny of cuts. So instead, what they did is they created the Budgetary Control Act of 2011, which couldn't be more of an oxymoron if you tried. Basically, it said, okay, we'll kick the can past the 2012 presidential elections, and then we'll have uh, a sequester, meaning if uh, we can't have any cuts by then, these automatic cuts will kick in. Well, lo and behold, we uh, got to 2012 elections, and we had the fiscal cliff, which means the actual cuts, if they, if they kicked in, would have been a major uh, negative shot to the economy. So Congress actually did something. On New Year's Eve 2013, they did the fiscal cliff deal where they dramatically cut the uh, sequester cuts. And since then, they've even cut them more because... They saw, for instance, that uh, they couldn't have no air traffic controllers uh, or less air traffic controllers. So they said, ah, screw those two. We'll just, keep, we'll just keep spending there. And in the big picture of things, this giant sequester that they talked about is only cutting annual spending by a measly $85 billion. And that's compared to the $2.3 trillion that the debt ceiling was raised to. $16.5 trillion is the new ceiling. Oh, wait a second. They got to that ceiling in May. So what Congress passed was a budgetary, a debt ceiling delay, which allowed them to simply ignore the debt ceiling and let debt continue to grow uh, until May. So between January and May, it went up from 
uh, $300 billion from about $16.1 trillion to $16.4 or five. And then they, fr they, they froze it right there and started using these extraordinary measures, which is what they did in 2011 as well, which simply means, well, for one, they just basically steal money from the federal pensions and pay them and pay down debt with it. But of course, they still owe the money back to those pensions. And some other incredible things like having, remember, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which have $5 trillion of off-balance sheet debt, are are owned by the the uh, the government, so they had Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac pay them dividends, pay the government dividends, and say that they were taking that money and using it to pay down uh, debt. The problem with that is, well, for one, if they if the, any increase in the Freddie uh, Freddie and Fannie uh, businesses was due to this uh, this fake boom that co caused by them lowering interest rates or nothing, and now it's turned right back around as rates are up and housing is rolling over. So they probably paid money that they that they didn't have. <laughs> That's number one. Uh, and as for Freddie and Fannie going forward, they just if they took money and gave it to the federal government, well now they have they are less solvent. So it's really just paying taking from Peter to pay Paul. So it's really just an accounting shenanigan because uh, that money is still owed, whether it's off balance sheet or on balance sheet. And so when they do. Uh, raise the but the debt ceiling, which of course they're going to do, especially because Obama says he won't negotiate with Congress about that. Which I still don't understand why he can't negotiate when Congress is the one who's supposed to be approving this, not him. Uh, but anyway, the second that they announce it, where they uh, take the ceiling from 16.7 trillion up to 18 trillion or 20 trillion, or they just say there is no debt ceiling, the day that it's passed. The debt is going to go up by 300 billion or so because all these extraordinary measures have to be paid back. Uh, so in the end game, with all the the hype about oh we're cutting uh, the deficits and Fannie Mae is doing so well, the debt is going to go up a trillion dollars this year, no matter how they slice it. And you, you can take that to the bank; it will be over 17 trillion by year end, potentially quite a bit above 17 trillion. This is uh, remember, there's basically been a 100% correlation between the gold price and the debt ceiling going back forever, uh, up until April of this year, of course, when the, the cartel was so terrified by what was going on, they'd have done these vicious attacks that have gone on for the past six months. Of course, the result of that attack is that we are now seeing dramatically lower physical inventories everywhere. I mean, GLD has seen a 32% drop in the inventory uh, compared to a 20% drop in the gold price. And as for the COMEX registered inventory, uh, gold inventory, and that's the inventory that is available for you to buy if you buy a, a futures contract, it's down an incredible 78% just since April. Uh, and that means we've gone from 3 million ounces down to 665,000 ounces today. Uh, so it's very likely that pretty soon we're going to completely run out of inventories there. And, we'll, and at that point, how anyone could believe that the COMEX is going to be a price determining mechanism when they have no gold is beyond me. Uh, and the same thing goes with the LBMA, where we know that the inventories are being rapidly drained. A lot of it is going to Switzerland, which is where all the refiners are. And the refiners, from what I hear, have been full out. So clearly they're taking the, the uh, London bars and they're turning them into things that the East likes, you know, like kilobars, metric stuff, uh, you know, other types of products. And we know it has to be coming from somewhere because Chinese imports alone, just the part that they talk about, they publish, are, are double what they were last year. And we know that premiums around the world in the Eastern Hemisphere have been uh, as high as they've ever been. So clearly the, the gold is being sucked out of the West and into the East. And then, of course, you have the mining industry, which uh, for the past decade has been gradually deteriorating because of all the damage done by the cartel keeping prices too low. But particularly in the last five years, as prices for mining have surged and the um, and and the uh, and the revenues have not been able to keep up, so we're at the point where right now the mining industry is just falling apart. I think, as I just wrote last week, I think third quarter earnings are going to be even worse than second quarter earnings, which were beyond horrible. And it's uh, possibly you can already you're going to see not only write downs of projects but write downs of resources. And of course, the production guidance is going to is going to plummet. I, I really believe that, based on what we've seen, we could see a 15 to 25 percent drop in gold and silver production over the next three to five years. Uh, in fact, Eric Sprott already believes we may be down five percent in 2000 this year in 2013 versus 2012, which.
which would be quite remarkable since gold was over $1,700 an ounce in the first uh, few months of the year. So anyway, these are a couple of things that are out there. I mean, there's a lot going on. It's the fall. It's the busiest time for markets. It's the, the busiest seasonal period for gold and silver. And I really believe that, um, that at some point in the near future, all these things that, it, that uh, the cartel has been able to, to uh, stop cold with their naked shorting are going to fail on them. Uh, so uh, if you have any questions, uh, please call Miles Franklin, 800-822-8080. Uh, go to our blog on, on milesfranklin.com, or, um, or you can have it emailed every day. Just put your email address in. And, of course, I can be reached at ahoffman at milesfranklin.com. Bye for now.